uh, we are just formulated what a formula was. Okay. So, one formula we have not introduced there that was the equality predicate. If you can see your notes. So, top bottom predicates everything we accepted except the equality predicate. So, the equality predicate is a specific thing we do not want to give the same format as for other predicates we will write it in infix notation because it is it will be easier for us to read. Okay. Instead of writing equal to a comma b it will be easier for us to say a equal to b fine. So, we will be using the infix notation there. So, I think the unique parsing will still hold same kind of proof with infix notation in instead of outfix for one. Okay. So, let us give that grammar again a formula uh, can be top or it can be bottom or it can be any predicates with zero arity right. So, there we are specifying specially because it will not have any arguments. So, we write say p i 0 or it can be p i j then it should have j number of arguments. So, to show that we will not write just t j times we will say t 1 to t j instead. So, we will write t 1 to t j where t 1 to t j are generic terms any generic terms. So, they can be same they can be different and so on. Then we will include the equality predicate here say s equal to t that is our infix notation. Okay. We are not writing the usual form of this would be s comma t that we are not writing we are writing in the infix notation. Then what else we have? We have to take care of the connectives and the quantifiers. Okay. So, we say not x or x and x or x or x or x implies x or uh, x by conditional x or there can be quantifiers. Okay. So, there can be for each x x or for there is x x. Fine. So, out of this the first row they are called the atomic propositions or atomic formulas instead not propositions now. There are no connectives no quantifiers in those. So, they are called the atomic ones and all the others are to be said as compound ones compound formulas or compound WFFs well formed formulas. This is just a terminology which might be useful later. Now, let us see how do you symbolize for usual context and how many brackets or parentheses you can omit as per the propositional uh, logic. In propositional logic we had put down some conventions. So, that some parentheses you can omit while in writing and it might improve also legibility right. Like the outer parentheses you can omit that is only required for the unique parsing. Now, once you get matured you can forget it and still read it uniquely. Fine. So, that is our first rule that we will forget the outer parenthesis, we will not write it. Then some more can be reduced by laying down the precedence rules. Okay. So, the same precedence rules as per the propositional logic we will have not as the highest precedence, then and and or we will have the next precedence and implies and by conditional will have the lowest precedence, but now we have the quantifiers also. right? So, we will put quantifiers at the level of not, right? they look like unary. So, we will put them there. So, we will say not and these quantifiers for each x x and there is x x will have the highest precedence. Okay? So, our precedence rules will go like not for each x or there is x. So, in fact, all this for each there is will always come with some variable will generical write for each x there is x it need not be that particular variable x. Okay. So, these will have the first or the highest precedence. Next precedence will be and or as usual and the lowest will be biconditional and the 
uh, implies and the biconditional. Okay. So, this will reduce certain number of parentheses, but not all parentheses are omitted just like your propositional logic. There can be some which you want to show here, then it will be easier to read. Fine. Sometimes we also use extra parenthesis for legibility, we will see that occasion later where even if it is not allowed we will put extra parenthesis, so that our reading will be easier. Okay. So, we are not very fussy about parenthesis here, but if you have some doubt in reading then you have to be fussy, otherwise you cannot read it properly or precisely rather. So, this is our next convention and some more conventions we will put to reduce the cluster in writing the subscript and the superscripts. Okay. Suppose, in a context you use the word p uh, use the predicate p 1 and then you have three arguments there. Right. Throughout that context you are using three arguments with p 1, then it is not necessary to write p 1 3, we will forget that. Okay but we have to be careful there, because sometimes you will write p 1 with 3 arguments and again p 1 with 2 arguments, then there will be problem. Okay. So, we can do that omit the superscripts provided you always observe that in the particular context, that always you are using the same symbol with same number of arguments. Fine. So, then next what we will do, we will have still subscripts p 1, then p 0 or p 100 and so on then slowly we will forget them also, we will say p q r will accept as predicates, okay. forgetting the subscripts also. So, we can write these things for predicates, but equality predicate will be written as equality predicate, we will not confuse with anything else. Okay. Then similarly, for variables we may write x, y, z and so on instead of the subscripts x 0, x 1, x 2 instead of all those things we will use. Suppose, in a particular context you have more than say 100 variables, then you cannot write with x y z or any alphabet. So, we will go for again x 1, x 2, x 3 or even x y z then x 1, y 1, z 1 and so on. Okay. So, just to reduce cluster and writing better way. Then similarly, for the constants we will use a, b, c from the lower end of the small letters. So, they should have been written as f i 0, 0 are function symbols, they are the constants. Okay. So, instead of f i 0 that is f 1 0 or f 2 0 or f 3 0 and so on, we will just write a b c small letters. And then again for the function symbols instead of writing f j i i may range from 1 to 100 or so on and j might be number of arguments it takes. You will again say f of that many arguments always use in the context. So, forget j then f i you can forget by writing f g h and so on. Okay. So, we will write f g h and so on for the function symbols. So, these are variables constants. So, these are the individual constants these are individual variables, then these are function symbols, okay. then there is one more which sometimes we follow sometimes we do not. So, it is about the commas, in predicates it is customary not to write the commas and the brackets. Okay. For example, you have say p of x 1 x 2. So, instead of this we will just write p x 1 x 2 or even p x y, okay. but this will be capital letter they will be small letters. So, they will be taken as arguments, we will forget the commas also, it will sometimes it is easier to read this. Even for function symbols that can be followed forget the commas and go on writing, still you can prove unique parsing with that without the brackets, but sometimes it may not be easy for us to read. So, we will keep the commas if it is not easy, if it is easy to read okay, we will write only one argument is there okay. just you can simply write it with or without brackets. Okay. So, that will be our next convention. 
then now let us go back to our original thing what we wanted with all these shorthand writings whatever you get they are not really formulas they are sometimes called formulas abbreviated formulas formulas which have been abbreviated so you can expand it bring it to correct form by suitable uh, vocabulary of which one you are write, rewriting as what fine but we will regard them just as formulas and go on with that yes the well, what are the constants? The constants come from f with superscript 0, right. So, they are the function symbols having no arguments and function symbols we are writing for the definite descriptions which will be referred back to some objects, particular objects in some domain. That is our concept now, we have not materialized it, right. So, that means, these constants will refer to some persons, particular persons. What about predicates? They are also constants. Zero argument predicates, huh? yeah. they are not constants. Predicates when given some values, the arguments are filled in with proper objects or representative of objects gives you sentences, right. So, predicates without those arguments that is that superscript is 0 gives you propositions their atomic propositions. So, in that sense first order logic is an extension of the propositional logic, where you have the propositions, you have the connectives, everything of propositional logic. In addition you have some variables, function symbols and the quantifiers. We will give some example of constants, yes. Let us take our first example, we started with one simple argument, right. So, Bapuji was a saint. Each saint is an altruist. Therefore, Bapuji was an altruist. Fine. So, let us look at the first sentence, how do we symbolize it? We have to find out, we are going now deeper into the structure of the sentence, not only as propositions. So, now in this sentence, this is one subject and this is the predicates. So, grammatically you can say some phrase and so on, but now for us everything will be predicates or names or quantifiers, these are the three things we have to translate with. Now, here we find that somebody is a sense that is one predicate, right. So, we build up our vocabulary say s x, let us write it for x is a cent. Now, what about Bapuji? It is a name, particular person, right. This is what we understand from this, in some other context it means something else. So, this is what we understand now with our common knowledge. So, now this will be taking as a constant it is a zero array function symbol. It might refer to a particular person, a definite description without any arguments, right. So, we will start with say B Bapuji. Unlike our English language, they will be small letters. In English language, they will be starting initial letter will be capital for the names, ok. So, for us they are the small letters. So, now the first sentence you can translate into first order logic, right. It will be just S B, it is S with bracket P, right, but we are forgetting the brackets now. So, first sentence can be symbolized. What about the second one? X is a cent, so we need our increasing our vocabulary. We do not know how to write altruist, so let us write it first. Say A X, X is an altruist. Okay. That is enough for this, this is also ok. Now, we can go for the translation. So, first one is Bapuji is a saint, we may write S B. Second is if x is a saint, then x is an altruist, right. So, first you forget the quantifier, just look at it. 
what does it say? It is not as for each x, x is a cent and x is an Actually, it is the rule. When you translate from the English sentences and you have the quantifier as for each, then it will be an implication. It will not be an and, it will not be a conjunction. Usually, that is the rule, right. Sometimes it may break down if you come across some mathematical theorems. Huh? But usually, when you come from the natural English, it will come like this. So, the second sentence is for each x, if x is a cent, then x is an altruist. Okay. Then you have the last sentence and that will give us the consequence. This consequence is valid or not, we do not know. We are just writing the same way as the propositional logic. We will introduce the symbols later probably. Now, what will it say? Bapuji was an altruist. So, A of B, is that okay? The argument can be symbolized this way. So, let us see some more examples. This will really clarify the meanings later, the meaning formal semantics we are going to develop. Okay. <coughs> Suppose we take this sentence, everyone has a father. Now, how do you symbolize this? Only this much, everyone has a father. Huh? Well, you are writing x has a father, x we do not know what it is, it is a variable. For each x, x is a father, okay. not some, right. When you write everyone, it does not say for some x, it says for every. So, for each x, x has a father. Now, x has a father that itself you can take as a predicate, because in the context we are not going deeper into father or mother or has a, he has a pen, fountain pen, he has a father. Huh? This has a can be different, but still you can write as one, right? or it can be different. So, having a pen and having a father may be of different category. So, though the same word has been used, you might like to represent in a different way depending on the context. So, translation is not really a literal translation, you have to look at the meaning slightly and then translate. Okay. Now, what happens here? X has a father will write as another predicate. Okay. So, suppose X has a father will write as F X. f is the predicate, x has been used in the as an argument there. Right? So, when we say has a father with a blank, that is the predicate. Right? When you fill up that blank, it becomes a sentence. Say, fill up with Bapuji, Bapuji has a father, it becomes a sentence. Right? But if you write a variable there, it is not still a sentence, it is an unfinished sentence. Right? it has to proceed with a quantifier, otherwise it does not give us any meaning. Is it clear? So, now we say that this sentence will be represented as for each x f x. Okay. Suppose you want to go a bit deeper, you say every one means every man. Okay. Every man, let us say, or every person. Now, then what do you say? Has a father means there is a person who is his father. Right? So, we can rewrite it in a different way that every person corresponding to every person. there exists a person who is his father. 
So, please do not get offended with his or her, huh? I am using his for universal. We have to do something, otherwise, you have to write always his and her. Okay. Now, how do you translate this? This is also a translation of the same sentence, everyone has a father. Okay. Now, how do you translate? See, has a father is now dissected, right? It is no more one predicate. Somebody is a father, that is now a predicate, right? But it is not just is a father, is his father. So, y is the father of x, that is really involved, right? It is not just is a father, it is not a unary predicate, is a father, it is a binary predicate now. Somebody is somebody else's father. Okay. So, now we have f x y, we may say x is father of y. Our vocabulary is now this. Okay. Now, if you take every person, somebody is a person, you want to go to that level, somebody may not be a person. Right? So, then you have to introduce another predicate, somebody is a person, is a man or a human being, for that you are keeping person, not for congaries, right. In that case, we will say, let us say h of x, x is a person, is a human being. Now, how do you translate this? Corresponding to every person. So, it is every is really ambiguous here. You read it at corresponding to each person, then ambiguity is over. Huh? You do not say corresponding to all persons, <laughs> only God can come there, huh? who is the father of everyone. <laughs> okay. So, you have to read it as corresponding to each person, that is in the context. So, again you have to read it correctly. So, better use the word each. Then it says, whatever person you start with corresponding to each x, you will get another person, right. So, there is y, okay. so you want to write first that x is a person, okay. fine. So, you will say, for each x, if x is a person, then there exists somebody who is his father. So, there exists some y such that f y x, right. We wrote x y, x is father of y. So, first one is the father of the second one. So, here y should be your father of x. So, we will write f y x. Okay. Is it all right? Can you write it this way also? There is a difference. The difference is it says uh, all x will become human beings. Right? If you write like this, that will be the meaning of the sentence. For each x, there exists one y who is his father, but what is that x? That x has to be a human being now. Right? Is that clear? So, it assumes that each x has to be a human being here. Here we do not assume, we say if it is, if it is not then we do not know, nothing is coded here. If x is not a human being, nothing is coded here, but x is not a human being does not arise here. 
that is taken every x, whatever object you take it is a human being. Okay? That is the difference. Still it can be a translation of that provided you mean that way. We do not know what it means. Right? But common thing is this, this is what we understand immediately. Okay? And what about the sentence for each x there is y, h x implies f y x. What about this? Hmm? Yeah. Is it the same as below? Yeah. No. Which means if, if at all for every y you will say that the y is a father of x. No, only x is If x is a person, for every y you will say that y is a father of. Not there exists. There exists. But he is saying here that if hx is not true, then definitely there exists a y such that uh, there is a father. Oh, okay. So, that cannot hold. Well, this implies we will say not hx, not hx or f y x. Right? So, let us take it that way. For each x, there exists y, x is not a person or it has a father. Okay, think about it a bit. Huh? Are they same or not? If I write implies here and the last one, whether these two are same or not. We will come to it again when we come to formal semantics, whether they are same or not. So, remember and think about this. We will not decide about this now. We have not put two symbols. Huh? There are two cases. Okay. So, one case is with and that we find it is not okay, it is not of the same meaning as this. Then we are putting implies and asking whether it has the same thing as this, whether it can be translated as that or not. Okay. We stop it there. If two persons fight over third one's property, then the third one gains. Now, what is the vocabulary here? Third one gains, we do not know whether it gains the same property or it gains somewhere else, right. It might be giving him some good omen, he will gain in some lottery. <laughs> okay. So, you can just if you do not want to go deeper, you can say fight over another's property as one, right. But if you want to say it is third one's property exactly, not just another's, right? So somebody's property will be one predicate. Fight over something, and who are fighting? That will be another predicate, right? Then gains something that is another predicate. Okay, just gains x gains. That will be another predicate. Is that okay? So, let us start that way. Say fight over x and y, x and y fight over uh, fight over z. Right? Something they are fighting over something that may be property of somebody. So, they are fighting over z. So, this is now a ternary predicate. Let us write f x y z. Okay. Next, what is involved? 
third one's property, someone's property, right? So we'll write x is someone's property. You want to write it as a function? Property of x. That's better, right? Okay. So property of x will be written as say p of x. You can write f of x or h of x. Huh? We will let g of x, but g will be used here, this is h, h of x. Okay? Next, x gains is a predicate, it is a unary predicate, so we will let g x. Fine? So, this is not for some first one, some second one, some third one, this is for everyone, right? So, that we have to check from this place. Once we write if two persons, is it taking only two persons from this class or somewhere? If nothing is mentioned, right? Like man is mortal. So you don't say each man is mortal. You just say man is mortal. Then how to translate it? Whether some man is mortal or every man is mortal? The common common sense says that every man is mortal. That is what meant by the sentence man is mortal, right? It is a generic one. So, here all those persons we can quantify for all, for each, over all those persons, right. So, we may say for each x, for each y, for each z, equality predicate will come later slowly. So, let us see first. So, this says f x y z, if x and y fight over z, but they are not fighting over another person. We want for each person here, right? they are fighting over another's property. So, property of z let us say, right? so you may write here h of z. Then what happens? The third one gains g z, that is all. Now, we come to the exact meaning. It says that is first one, second one, third one. There are two persons and then the third person, right. So, if we write just like this, it will say one person can fight with himself over his own property. That is allowed. Is it okay? And he also gains. So, we do not want that vacuousness to be present, right. We want them to be distinct. So, we can use the equality predicate. Okay. So, that means x, y and z should be distinct persons here, fine. Then we may say for each x, for each y, for each z, if x is not equal to y and y is not equal to z and z is not equal to x you have to be very specific right and f x y s z then g z is it okay this is better than the earlier one now what about that earlier example you have not told about that can one person be his own father it allows No, common sense does not allow it. We have to take the common sense into account while translating. Father can just mean something, I can define father. No, it can mean anything, yes. See, father may not be father in common sense, right? It can be brother, huh? it can be one person who hears the same heart, right? We do not know the meaning of father. In that sense, it is unlike. Okay, in that sense, it is alright, it can be any predicate, but it is not the one what we say in natural language. Once you say father, we have some meaning to attach to it. Can there exist y with the same x? Then it will satisfy x is the father of y, right? Yes, that is the question. See, the question here is let us say last one, which we agreed to be alright. 
for each x if x is a person then there is a person y who is his father right so that also allows that x to become his own father it can be that same y can be that x also it doesn't mean it has to be yes somewhere that we have to say if it is a person then there is another person who is his father right so then there exists y such that y is not equal to x and f y x definition we can say x is a father of y x not and x is not y and x is not equal to y yeah you can do that right? it's easier but that will not allow you to write at other places but that's all right in this part, okay. that's okay in this case also you can input that itself here x is father of y and x is not the same as y included but then it's better to include it here there can be somewhere you need x equal to y right So yes. here we should also include that h of y in the implication because it says there exists a person who is his father. I mean that is yes. not implicit in yes. f x. Okay. So what will be the better translation here? You'd say for each x, h x implies implies there exists y who is a person and not equal to x says that h y and and f y x is okay it gives better sense than the earlier so sometimes such implicit assumptions will really tell you that your argument is not correct there maybe there is some implicit assumption that's why you are not getting the answer so it has to go into the translation process itself okay so common sense is the most difficult one and you have to tackle it at the time of translation itself not later okay is that clear <coughs> so these types of things can come up in translation you have to be cautious about it that's what it says sometimes you may need equality sometimes you may not need and so on okay let's go back to our original thing you have done some translations now the question is how to say that whether something follows from it or it doesn't follow from it okay and there is another thing you might have noticed in all these translations it is not a sentence of the type px a sentence always will be coming for each x px or there exists x px okay from natural language when it comes as a sentence it never comes like that so you want to really distinguish between these types of things where all the variables that are used they are quantified and where they are not quantified okay and something deeper we want there so we define certain concepts which will be useful later so that is called the scopes and bindings these are really scopes and bindings of the quantifiers which we are using so one scope is a very simple thing like you consider a formula and take an occurrence of a quantifier okay then start from that occurrence of the quantifier find out till how much you can go to make a formula that is called a sub formula right in fact you can generalize it a bit you say that any substring of the same formula which itself is a formula is called a sub formula of the original okay that's easier to express so given a formula formula say x we say a substring of x say y is called a sub formula of x if y itself is a formula it has to be a substring a part of that 
and also it has to be a formula, then you call it is a sub formula. So, that means you take any substring that is not really a sub formula. Okay. Let us take any example we have done. For example, I start from this place, this is not this is a substring, but it is not a sub formula. Okay. I start from this place, I write up to this. This is a substring, but this is a sub formula. Right. By itself, it is a sub formula. Though brackets and other things are needed, now we are using abbreviated formulas. So, we can make it a sub formula by using brackets alone. Okay. Suppose you take from this one, right, from the abbreviated formulas. Now, you take this as a string. So, this string by itself is a sub formula, you may say, but in the abbreviated form, it is giving the trouble. Suppose it is in the expanded form, then what happens? Where are the brackets? So, you will be having brackets so many places. Let us take one side, say I have a bracket here then I have a bracket here, okay. then I have a bracket here. Okay. Now, with the brackets you see it is not a sub formula, is it clear? Okay. So, you have to be a bit careful whether brackets are there or not, but we are thinking always not of the abbreviated formula of the formula itself whatever is the correct one, because sub formula really needs your unique parsing. Unless you have the unique parsing, you cannot define sub formula correctly. Right? So, brackets are to be inserted to verify whether it is a sub formula or not. Is it okay now? Okay? Now, let us see. <coughs> For example, I take this as a, let us write it in the abbreviated form. So, it looks like for each x, for each y, for each z not x equal to y, not y equal to z, not z equal to x and f x y h of z implies g of z. Okay. Now, let us take one occurrence of a quantifier. So, z. Now, from starting from this place, you find a sub formula. Okay. So, that is called the scope of this occurrence of the quantifier. Is it now clear? Again, again you have to think of the abbreviated formulas and the formulas. If you have abbreviated formulas, there can be a confusion of getting the scope. So, always you have to think of the formulas in the expanded form in the correct form, not in the abbreviated formulas. Right? But here it is easy, it is not confusing. It says that the scope of the formula is this underlined thing, scope of this occurrence of the quantifier. It is a sub formula. Does not matter. We have never told anywhere in a formula, definition of the formula that everything has to be quantified. They are not sentences. When you translate from English sentences, you will not get them. That is what it is. Right? But they are allowed as formulas, like in the atomic formulas. Suppose I have x as a variable. So, every variable is a term. Right? Now, suppose I take p 1 1. Okay? So, p 1 is the predicate with one argument vacant. So, I have to do this. Now, this is a formula by definition. Yes. How the terms are Those defined? Oh. If you go back to the terms, it says you have the variables, you have the constants, you have the function symbols. Using those things, terms are generated. So, by definition, each constant is also a term each variable is also a term and then functions where arguments can be other functions terms they can be variables constants or other terms right and in the formulas when you define you say p of t1 t2 tm 
so you can have variables there is that okay so this is allowed as a formula though you will not get it while translating from the english sentences fine so that's what we are saying here you just construct a sub formula starting from that occurrence that gives you the scope of that occurrence of the quantifier only for the occurrence of the quantifier see quantifier is only one here for all fine but there are three occurrences of the quantifier one with for each x for each y then with for each z it can happen that this for each z also occurs somewhere right let's see an example suppose we have for each z pz implies for each z px right this is also allowed as a formula even though z is not here for each z is there still it is allowed right because all that we say is for each x x if x is a formula and x small x is a variable then for each x x is a formula right so in this capital x we never said that small x has to occur so everything is allowed there because at this stage of the grammar we can't specify all those things right but later we have to take care at some point we will see what happens why we have allowed all those things right but till now it is allowed therefore this for each z there are two occurrences of for each z not only for each for each z there are two occurrences so if i take i say what is the scope of for each z it will have no meaning right i have to say which occurrence so i say the first occurrence of for each z what is its scope it is the whole formula if i say what is the scope of the second occurrence of for each z it will be only this much is that clear so it is the occurrence of a quantifier and its scope that's what we are defining okay any doubts yes it includes the occurrence of the quantifier it starts from this place itself hmm? from that occurrence so scope of for each z will be the whole formula right one can define without it also doesn't matter but we will include it so that it will be easy for us to see where for what the formula it is giving rise to 